come and speak uh, for us. She's the head of energy and environment at the National Physics Laboratory, and um, I will talk more and you can make your introduction. Uh, thank you very much. We'll be having um, a talk for about 40 minutes. There'll be a chance for Q&A and, and some, uh, some drinks and nibbles at the end to so stay and have a little chat with us. Thank you. Thank you. Is there somewhere I need to stay for this video? Um, I do not know. Okay. I'll, won I'll wonder. I feel like in, I mean, only the screen is being recorded, so oh, okay. it's screen plus sound. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Well, thanks for inviting me. Um, I was under the impression before I came that you were all climate scientists, but I've just found out from Geraldine that that's not the case. Um, so I was wondering if I could find out who's in the room. If you stick your hand up if you associate yourself with climate science. Oh, there's quite a few. So I've deliberately avoided climate science because I thought there's probably nothing I can teach climate scientists. Uh, how about energy people? Oh, about, about an even amount. As it, and anybody else? I guess it's the... <laughs> what, what do you do? Um, I'm on the board of the same Okay. And how about back there? Theoretical physicists. Theoretical physicists, wow. And there was a few hands over here. Health. Health. Okay, thanks. Well, if I'm uh, telling you stuff you already know, please do this kind of motion and I shall hurry up. Uh, and if there's anything that you didn't understand, then uh, please ask a question. And I think we're, I'll, I'll try and time this for about 35, 40 minutes so that we've got a good 15, 20 minutes for questions at the end. Um, so I was going to cover uh, four questions. Uh, how will energy systems adapt to a changing world? Uh, what are the drivers for global energy transformation? Can we make the transformation happen in the time scale that we're aiming for? Um, and what are the opportunities? And then finish up with what are the barriers and uh, some recommendations uh, as to ways that maybe we can overcome them. Uh, so first up, oops, the energy, how, how will energy systems adapt to a changing world? Um, well, lots of predictions about the future and deadlines for uh, climate change and how we want to transform the energy system focus on the world in 2050. And I think it's a reasonable deadline. It's kind of close enough that it's material. We've got just over 30 years to get there. Uh, but it's far enough away that we can envisage that a completely different, we might be in a completely different future when we get there. Um, and it's kind of quite sobering to think it is only 32 years away. I was going to start off with a little bit of a pop quiz to see what people think the future in 2050 will look like. Um, so on a, on a population level, we're at uh, 7.5 billion people today. Um, any guesses for the forecast population in 2050? Just shout out. 11, 10. 11, 10. 9. 9. 9. Yes, yeah, somewhere there. Uh, 9.8 billion people is the average of most uh, forecasts, so 30% more people than now. Um, urbanisation, we're at about 50% of us live in, in cities or urban areas at the minute. How many do you think by, what percentage by 2050? 70. You guys are good. <laughs> Um, and that's obviously important because um, despite what you might think about the economies of scale of people living in quite a concentrated area, uh, actually people living in cities use an awful lot more energy than people living in the countryside. Um, and final quiz question for the day, and this is, a, this is quite a difficult one actually. Um, the sum total of world primary energy at the moment, so this is uh, primary energy, all transport, heat, industry, and it includes the losses from production, um, is 590 exajoules of energy. So obviously, an exajoule is a very large amount of energy. Uh, you don't really need to know about exajoules. I actually can tell you that the average nuclear power station would take 140,000 years to produce one exajoule, so it's a lot. Uh, we don't need to know about exajoules. How many do you think we will be using in 2050, assuming no energy efficiency. So if we carry on as we are, each person using the same amount. I mean, I guess you could do the maths. Any guesses? We're on, we'll be on about 880. So you're, you guys are uh, pretty knowledgeable. And obviously, this increase in demand isn't unprecedented. Um, 
in the last 32-ish years, uh, we have gone from uh, four and a half billion people to seven and a half, so 65-ish uh, percent increase in population, but energy demand has increased by, well, it's more than doubled. So we've, we, we're, we're able to get to that 50-ish percent increase over the next 35 years because we've already more than doubled the amount of energy that we have used over the last 35 years. So it sounds like a big number, but we've done it once already. Um, what is unprecedented is the way that we generate energy and the amount that that needs to transform. So this is a chart of pie chart of world primary energy sources in 1980. Um, if you can't see the, uh, the words at the bottom here, light blue is renewables. You actually can't see that because rounded down from the 0.3% that it was in 1980, it appears a zero on the chart. Uh, orange is hydro, grey nuclear, yellow fossil fuels, and dark blue biofuels. What do you think the percentage of um, primary energy from fossil fuels was in 2015? 80? 2? 78? 25 renewable and hydro. 25 renewable and hydro. My second question was going to be, and how much renewables, all this investment that we've had over the last decade massive cost decreases in solar and wind. I think we've gone from 0.3 of a percent in 1980 to 35 years on. 5%, 15. Unfortunately, um, yeah, we're on 1.3 now. And um, still 81% fossil fuels, so uh, the lady in the yellow shirt has it. Um, we haven't, you know, despite all of this investment in renewables that has happened, the share of the mix that fossil fuels has is still exactly the same. And obviously that's because the, this bubble has grown in, more than doubled in size. So we've really increased the amount of investment into renewables, but it's still a very, very small percentage of the mix. So that really shows us what the challenge is for the next 35 years. It's changing these percentages at the same time as massively increasing the amount of energy that we produce. Um, so the other challenge uh, that often doesn't really get talked about because it's quite a lot less exciting is energy efficiency. Um, this is that 880 which actually to be fair is the top end of all forecasts about how much energy we'll need to produce in 2050. All of these other rings are different quite kind of average forecasts for how much energy uh, we might need to produce based on different assumptions about energy efficiency and how well we do that. So um, we need to increase the size of the, uh, the total primary energy, but we also need to get much more efficient. Um, so that's the top level predictions for how much energy demand will change. There's also lots of drivers governing how will meet that demand. Um, so this is, the, this is the bit that I was going to very quickly uh, scrimp on, the kind of climate science, because I thought that you were all climate scientists. This one slide in the entire presentation on climate change. Um, this is a, a graphic um, showing, I haven't written down whose it is actually, Joe might know, but it's showing um, the average increase in temperature since 1950 and uh, the temperature deviations are in the top there, so it's plus or minus two degrees from uh, the 1950 average. And you can see as the, the kind of clock ticks up, things are getting hotter. Um, the warming, everybody acknowledges, is now unequivocal. We've got more than 400 uh, parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, um, which without humans will be about 280. Arctic sea ice minimum is decreasing by about 13% per decade. Um, 286 gigatons of land ice is melting a year, and uh, sea level rises are over 3 millimetres a year. And energy is a massive driver of all of this. Um, and climate change and the climate change negotiations are a massive driver of what's happening in energy. Um, 
you will all be aware that the Paris Agreement headline target is to keep uh, global temperature rises to no more than two degrees by the end of the century, um, with an aim to pursue efforts to one and a half degrees. And Joe Haig, who you probably all know, wrote a very good blog uh, about it uh, in Carbon Brief. in the conversation a couple of weeks ago that if you haven't read it's well worth um, reading about how we need to uh, improve our efforts and make sure that we're working towards the one and a half degrees. Having said that, uh, the sum total of commitments under the Paris Agreement uh, have us on a path to 2.7. So actually all of the pledges that we've got so far, even though people have signed up to the two degree target unequivocally, uh, only get us to uh, over two and a half degrees. So there's quite a lot more ambition that needs to be worked into the system as we're coming up now for the review periods and people might be increasing their, hopefully will be increasing their pledges. Um, and it obviously has really big implications for energy. The International Energy Agency says the full implementation of these pledges, so this is to get us to two and a half degrees uh, rather than one and a half, will require the energy sector to invest US dollars of 13.5 trillion in energy efficiency and low carbon technologies from 2015 to 2030, an annual average of 840 billion US dollars a year. So quite a lot of investment required to get to the, the pledges that we've got, which also need to be made much more ambitious. So driver number one, um, is absolutely climate change. The second driver for transforming the energy system is security of supply. This is a map of um, gas pipelines to Europe and uh, you'll have seen after the, um, the events in Salisbury the headlines in the Telegraph about uh, how much of our gas we get from Russia. Carbon Brief then um, found out that it's actually less than 1%. So in the UK, we're all right um, as, as far as relying on Russia goes. But obviously, gas and oil come from many volatile parts of the world. And so energy security is still an issue for the UK. Uh, in Europe, there is, I think it's about 40% of Europe's natural gas comes from Russia. But the level varies significantly. And obviously, renewable energy is one very good way for countries to have security and control over their own energy supply. The third driver um, which is talked uh, quite a lot about at the moment is energy prices and affordability. This is a chart of UK energy costs, um, electricity and gas per kilowatt hour. The numbers are quite hard to see but you can kind of see the trajectory uh, over the last, well, the 10 years from 2004 to 2014 and electricity prices increased 63% and gas 115% over that decade. So there's people, the, the fuel poor obviously care about this the most. That's people for whom um, a significant percentage of their income is spent on energy. But it's a, it's a big deal for lots of people and it makes the headlines a lot of the time. So it's something that uh, the government cares a lot about. And obviously there's a lot of things affecting the price of energy, uh, global oil and gas price fluctuations, um, volatility and exchange rates, and um, the variety of where, where you get your imports from, basically, which countries you're getting them from and what the conditions are in those countries, and also the weather. Um, but uh, obviously for renewables, they don't suffer from many of those things, the straight exchange rate volatility. They're more stable, they're more predictable, and costs are going down as technology matures. The fourth driver for um, transforming our, our energy system globally is to give access to people who don't already have access to electricity. There's about a billion people in the world that have no access at all. And the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, target universal access by 2030. So this, um, this chart is the share of the population with access. And dark blue is... 100% uh, have access, so you can kind of see who is um, suffering the consequences of lack of access to electricity. Ooh. So, K 
can, can we make it? Uh, it's a huge transformation, lots of really important drivers. Um, is it possible? Uh, can we get there? I think so. Um, it's both technologically and economically possible. Um, technologically, we do, I mean, we obviously need innovation. I work uh, in innovation in both of the jobs that I'm doing at the moment. And uh, yet it's also fair to say that we have many of the technologies that we need and uh, a lot of the work needs to be in figuring out how to scale them up quickly and redirecting finance uh, to these sorts of technologies. And this is uh, uh, a few of them. They're obviously not just about electricity and power, um, energy storage, uh, energy efficiency for the home, and transportation has a lot uh, to do with it as well. And I think applications like um, electric vehicles, hydrogen vehicles, will drive a lot of the system change. Um, and it's economically possible as well. There's been huge reductions in costs. Um, and electricity production from renewables is eclipsing lots of people's forecasts. I took um, some forecasts from the US Department for Energy. They're usually pretty good at this kind of thing. Um, they used to have a lot of people working there on renewables. And um, so these are their predictions for the amount of energy, the, their 2006 predictions for the amount of energy that will be generated 10 years hence, so in 2016, from solar and wind. They got it wrong. It was quite a bit more. How far do you think they were out? Ish. By how many times? Have a stab. 100. 10. 49 times for solar, four and a half for wind. So they got, they got it wrong. And what I find quite amusing is all of these uh, different predictions from US Department for Energy, uh, the International Energy Agency, Bloomberg, loads of different people with a lot of resources behind them making forecasts. And for renewables over the last decade, um, the best forecasters have been Greenpeace, which I quite like. Um, and actually, before we, before we move on, one of the things that I was going to say about this is, you know, why are people getting it, why is it so hard, why are people getting it so wrong as this when they uh, really should know better? And the answer is that these cost reductions that have come in for both of these two technologies, everybody knows that they're going to happen at some point, but nobody knows exactly when. And when they do happen, there's a hockey stick, there's an, there's an exponential increase in or well, decrease in cost and increase in uh, installations when when that tipping point happens and when you see the forecasts they're always a straight line trajectory from now so people just uh, are predicting the same the same amount of growth as last year and so in no given year will they predict that this is the year that that's going that that hockey stick effect is going to take place um so this, is, this shows that, basically, for solar. This is the cumulative installed capacity um, for solar power from 2000 to uh, 2014, so similar-ish period that they were trying to predict. And that's, they're the installations going in. And at the same time, this blue curve is the costs coming down. And you can kind of see tipping point in costs, tipping point in installations at the same time, which makes sense. Um, so, yeah, it wasn't a huge amount of time ago that solar panels were only cost competitive on satellites and um, the cost has dropped very significantly. Um, so, what are the opportunities? I wasn't going to dwell a huge amount of time on this. Maybe we could pick it up in the questions a bit more. Um, I wanted to, to talk a little bit more about, well, at least mention transport and heat, because I think in uh, talks about energy, people tend to focus on electricity. Um, and obviously, there's huge opportunities in electrifying transport and heat, um, and then decarbonizing uh, electricity production. But there are also other opportunities, like using hydrogen in vehicles. Uh, there's research at the moment going into uh, whether or not you could combust hydrogen for heat in homes as an alternative to electrification. Um, 
And yeah, so it was just worth flagging that. Um, demand management, it's not just about producing energy or energy efficiency, avoiding it. It's also about shifting it and evening out peaks in demand or shifting demand to times of the day when renewables might be more likely to be generating. So that's one very ripe area for innovation. Um, one other point that um, I find quite interesting is that the new entrants in this um, energy trans that this energy transformation uh, are creating aren't just uh, small and medium-sized companies. I think when you think of innovation, or at least when I do, I think of you know some engineer in their garage. Uh, with some whizzy new technology that they've invented, getting little bits of knowledge transfer grants. But actually, many of the new entrants, in, um, given the energy transformation, are existing very large companies that just happen to operate in a different sector. So um, I read a really interesting article recently about supermarkets and how they're getting involved in being, uh, doing demand management. They can use their cold stores as giant energy stores. Uh, giant batteries basically and reduce the temperature in them very very low using energy overnight and then just switch their freezers off during the day and let them come back to uh, the temperature that they wanted um, and lots of lots of other uh, services that supermarkets have started to provide around energy and uh, I, in my kind of dream world I hope that because those companies are exactly the ones that are already really good at lobbying government, but maybe about food standards or fisheries, that maybe they could be a good force for change um, because they, they already have a lot of power, they already have a lot of credibility, they know how to do lobbying, and they're coming in on the side of energy transformation. Um, and then finally, obviously, it's a lot about new business models. It's making uh, the future technologies work in the current market environments, which is the very tricky period that we're in at the moment. So people who can innovate about how they attract finances to their services um, are incredibly valuable. Um, so the last question, what are the barriers and how can we overcome them? I've got four barriers and five recommendations because I wanted to uh, weight the talk towards positivity, uh, even though there's a lot getting in our way. Um, so the first barrier I have called innovation happens everywhere. Um, I think it's quite easy to think of innovation happening on you know, the length of a wind turbine blade or the efficiency of thin film solar PV. And it's easy to forget that actually there's loads of innovation happening in oil and gas as well. Uh, you don't need to worry a huge amount about all of the different lines on this chart. It's the amount of um, gas extracted in the US. If you just look at the orange line over a six-year period, there's a huge increase in the amount of gas from um, shale wells. And that was because of advances in tech drilling techniques and the technology used to extract that. So I think it, you know, we, we must always bear in mind that whilst we're thinking innovation is going to get us a long way with renewables in the fossil fuel sector, there's lots of innovation happening at the same time. So it isn't the case that innovation will decrease costs in uh, renewables and fossil fuels will just stay static. Actually, fossil fuels are advancing as well. It's getting cheaper to extract. It's getting easier to extract via different um, mechanisms. Second barrier to the transformation is that uh, at the moment oil is cheap and there is no price on, uh, not a really a meaningful price on carbon. Um, I don't know what the oil price is at the minute. I saw it a couple of weeks ago, it was about $60 a barrel. Um, I know as recently as a year and a bit ago it was about $30 a barrel. Um, and the carbon price last time I looked was about 10 euros. Um, for a, for a ton of carbon. So nowhere near the high oil prices and the high carbon prices that we would need uh, to catalyze the amount of investment that's required. Um, and whilst there's some promising moves, like uh, China is implementing a national carbon trading scheme, we, our experience in Europe is it's quite difficult to do it well in practice. Don't really need to 
<laughs> embellish this one, do I? Politics uh, is being filmed, so I shan't say um, too much. Um, the, I guess the energy implicating things that uh, President Trump has so far announced, things like repealing the Obama Clean Power Plan, um, which means that coal-fired power stations don't have to be phased out anymore. That is still being fought in the courts, uh, but that would not be a step forward in terms of emissions reductions. Um, the very visible move to uh, not sign up to the Paris Agreement um, and uh, attempted very large cuts to the budgets of organisations that historically have uh, protected the environment and... Um, uh, impose the regulations that are already in place around emissions, especially for shale gas wells and uh, flaring. Uh, the EPA um, proposal is uh, more than 20% cut in the next year. And then the final barrier, uh, before we move on to more positive um, vibes, is the unintended consequences of the transformation. Um, I don't know how far this is really... I don't think it's been huge in the news, but there's quite a lot of uh, human rights abuses in mines, uh, extracting things like cobalt, which we, we need for high energy density batteries. And there's lots of um, examples of unintended consequences around, say, the toxicity at the end of life of some technologies like batteries that we're going to need to uh, get around if we're going to deploy them at scale. They're not as perfect as we might like to think. So what do we need to do? Uh, well, five recommendations. <clears throat> so the first one is uh, around long-term policy. Um, for policies to be successful, they have to be well thought through over the long term. This, um, the example that I wanted to give is uh, about offshore wind targets in the UK. Around 2000 and... 11, the government had a target of growing offshore wind generation by 30% a year up till 2020. So every year they were going to increase it by 30%. So there's going to be a huge increase. And this was the, the UK 2020 offshore wind target, driven by the, the targets that we'd signed up to in Europe for 20% of our uh, energy from renewables by 2020. Um, and very controversially, the Committee on Climate Change said... Um, that they didn't think this target was advisable. Now, a lot of people think of the Committee on Climate Change as kind of environmentalists in the government um, disguise. And so people were quite upset with them that they recommended that this target should maybe be, be made smaller. But the reason that they did was because they said it wasn't going to be cost effective um, and that we wouldn't, the, the UK as a whole wouldn't benefit economically. And that's because there was absolutely no target for after 2020. So we had this big um, ramp up to 2020, but then as far as the industry was concerned, we weren't going to implement any more offshore wind. And so that what the Committee on Climate Change was saying was that actually isn't very convincing for industry to base any manufacturing here because they know that they can serve this country for... 10 years, and then maybe there's going to be no more business. So we won't get any jobs out of it. Plus, we'll have paid all of these R&D costs, all of the kind of high costs when the technology is relatively new. And other people will benefit from installing once we've uh, kind of tipped the, the cost. So they, they were advocating not to remove the target, obviously, but just to flatten it out and make it slightly longer term. And I think that was really, really good advice. Second recommendation, um, systems thinking, might be an obvious one. Um, but there's some, um, it's quite hard to do. The, there was an interesting report out by uh, the consultancy Bain recently, pointing out that with electric vehicles, many of the policies that governments are advocating or implementing assume that the vehicle itself changes and literally everything else stays the same. So the driving habits, mobility, the way we live our lives, everything else is identical. And so their policies tend to be about incentivizing private vehicle purchase, so replacement schemes, 
or um, putting lots of on-street charging points in where people are parking their cars. Um, and the, the point of the report was that as well as the future of energy changing, the future of mobility is changing at the same time. And it's quite likely that in 30 years' time, when everybody has an electric vehicle, people actually won't have a private vehicle. They'll be more likely to be using autonomous Uber or whatever the equivalent is. And so there'll be many more fleets of non-privately owned vehicles. And the charging infrastructure needed for those is going to be quite different. So uh, we need to think about that because infrastructure lasts a long time and we might drive something because of the energy system and forget to think about uh, innovations happening in other sectors. And I think the same is true a lot in energy with um, the future of finance, kind of distributed ledgers and what that might mean for energy, of which many people know more than me. So no questions on blockchain. Thank you. Um, so the, the third um, recommendation that I will make is that we need to think about standardization in an appropriate way. It's quite a boring point, I'm afraid. <laughs> boring but important. Um, and the, I guess there's two sides to it, which I will in illustrate through an example. Um, <clears throat> the current standard for silicon panels, solar PV panels, is... Um, you, you get a panel and you shine it under a bright light, 90 degrees, in a lab heated to, I think it's some quite reasonably high temperature, 25 degrees or something, and those are the test conditions. And then you see how efficient the panel is with this light shining directly above it in those test conditions. And that was fine for all of the time that all solar panels are made in the same way. It was a good way of saying, is this silicon solar panel more or less efficient than this silicon solar panel. What it didn't really do is tell us what the likely output was on a normal day in Manchester, say. Um, we, do, you know, we know how well it works when the sun is shining directly on it. That doesn't happen a lot in Manchester, um, I can tell you, having grown up there. Um, and, uh, but fine, you know, people found ways of modelling around that, and we learned over time, and we dealt with it. But now there are new types of um, photovoltaics that are produced in a very different way. And here's a thin film. In fact, I've brought one, so I shall start handing it around. It's quite interesting if you haven't seen it before. Uh, it's the same stuff that they put in the little bit of a calculator. I need this back at the end, if you don't mind. Um, so don't let me go without it. Uh, and that, the nice thing about that is um, the people who wanted uh, our lab to test it just stuck a, uh, an address sticker on the back and just popped it in the post, not even in an envelope. So they're reasonably resilient now. Um, but the thing about these is that they work better uh, in more diffuse light. So actually on a cloudy day, they're more likely to work better than on a sunny day, which means that... Um, the certification standard doesn't really work for them. If you're comparing them to a silicon panel, they're never going to work better than a silicon panel in any environment, let's be clear about that. They have a long way to go, but they work better than the test makes them look. And given that they're 10 times cheaper because you can print them with organic dye just like you can print a newspaper, you can print them on plastic, it's much lighter, you could literally roll these things out um, you might decide that you want to invest in it if you live in a cloudier environment <coughs> because it's 10 times cheaper and it doesn't matter if it goes off after a, a few years or isn't quite as efficient because you can wrap your building in it. So um, we need to make sure, that, yes, that the standard's in place, um, but also that they aren't the barrier to innovation, that we're, able, that we're agile enough that when a new technology comes on board, we're able to adapt them. And actually, um, the lab that I work for, the MPL, with a bunch of other national measurement institutes from around Europe, has developed new standards for this kind of technology that aren't about ideal lab conditions. They're testing in the lab, but what they're testing is a typical day in January in Northern Europe and a typical day in August in Southern Europe. And they're testing based on different sorts of conditions. Um, <coughs> so number four of five recommendations. Um, I think we need more of a culture of entrepreneurship. I um, have brilliant memories of um, 
a, d a day and a night and a day that I spent at Imperial in the engineering lab, which I think is over there somewhere, um, locked in uh, by one of your engineering professors, um, and with a bunch of other people, <laughs> quickly say. Um, and uh, it was through the climate kick, we were running a hackathon for innovators. And uh, we, we'd let this guy loose on the program, and he had them doing all kinds of things. The bubble wrap is because we all thought that we would be going home to bed uh, at night, but instead of allowing us to do that, he'd created a small corner um, full of bubble wrap that acted as bedding. And anyone who was lightweight enough to want to have a bit of a sleep uh, was, felt, could feel free to uh, take a bit of bubble wrap and go find a, a desk to sleep under. But I, I think that there's not enough of that. Uh, the Climate Kick was really, uh, is really good at um, kind of cross-disciplinary work, uh, helping students get experience of running a business, run, doing competitions, and many of the students who came out of their PhDs from that ended up um, choosing to run their own business rather than um, find a job that somebody else had created. And I think uh, that definitely within Europe, it's not our speciality entrepreneurship, and we need to get a lot better at it. Um, so we need to do more to foster that culture. And then finally, I would say something that I've learned um, working in the energy sector in the UK and in a lab that attempts to have an impact in the real world is that where companies and the government can be transparent about very specific problems, it's really helpful. Um, one area that uh, I think does really well at this is the utilities, um, well, specifically electricity and gas networks, because Ofgem has a fund, £100 million a year fund, um, for low-carbon projects. And um, because they have this fund, the uh, electricity and gas networks have become accustomed to publishing really quite detailed documents about all of the different challenges that they've got so that researchers and entrepreneurs can pick that up and say, ah, my technology, which actually I've hitherto only been applying in life sciences, actually could work for your issue of not wanting people to go to the top of a pylon. Um, and uh, the more open people can be about what their challenges are, the better. Um, one really good way of doing it for issues that maybe you don't think anyone has the answer is challenge prizes. And uh, the way that it works is you suggest a challenge, like um, with Nesta, we did a dynamic demand challenge, uh, where we said there's no technologies at the moment that are... Uh, can make demand management happen on a domestic scale and work with the existing market incentive. So we ran this prize, lots of people submitted their ideas and the best ones got incubated um, for a year, including from the Imperial Business School. And it's just a really nice way of bringing ideas through. In that particular instance, by the end of the uh, challenge, out of the five that we had down selected to incubate for a year, four of them had already got investment before we even did the judging. So, and there, one of them, um, a business called Upside, was an idea on a piece of paper when they started, and I just had an email from them, uh, well, not even from them, it was in the news, uh, that they've raised five and a half million in their second round of investment three years on. So it's you know, being clear about challenges that you think nobody is tackling and publicizing what they are will inspire people from completely different sectors to... Uh, apply their knowledge to energy and uh, sometimes it works out. So that was me um, and I believe we have 20 minutes for questions.